you found this skeleton, how would you tell people that you found this skeleton? You first, first, first. How would you decide? Well, that's a question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Once again, it's time to look into how badly wrong a creationist historian of geology can get cosmology. At least we are now into the part of the speech that's actually on topic. Well, enough preamble. Get your face protection, beverage, and snack, and settle in for some stupid. Well, that's false. They do publish their scientific research in peer-reviewed journals. They just don't publish their obviously creationist research in those journals because it's not going to get past the editor. It's not going to get past the editor because it's laughably wrong about virtually everything. I'm sorry that young earth creationism is on about the same level as flat earth in terms of being concordant with the evidence, but that's not the fault of the editors of journals. The fact is that no creationist paper can pass peer review because it's wrong. Not because editors are big muni heads. But they do publish other kinds of research in those journals. Yup. When creationists don't invoke untestable miracles and don't use lies, they can and do publish in peer-reviewed journals. In other words, when they do real science. If anything, this is evidence that the peer review system doesn't much care who the author is. It cares about the science being reported on. Well, Hart and Alt is another world-famous astrophysicist. He's so famous, I haven't heard of him and can't find him online. But then, I'm not sure how to spell his name. Maybe that will change if you bother to show his name on screen since you're referencing him. He was an, uh, an American atheist and also an opponent of the Big Bang. He said, scientists, particularly at the most prestigious institutions, regularly suppress and ridicule findings which contradict their current theories and assumptions. Astronomers now feel compelled to fit the observations to the theory and not vice versa. Ah, there we go. Now I can find him. And what do you know? He based his ideas that expansion was not real on the statistical artifact that at the time of his work, many quasars were in close angular association with galaxies, and that the redshift of these galaxies and quasars did not match. Of course, now that we have orders of magnitude more data, his hypothesis that redshift was both quantized and did not correspond to distance has now been thoroughly discredited. And it already had been when he made this quotation, and that was already 20 years old when you told us about it. In fact, this quote is more likely the bitter complaint of a man whose pet ideas were not supported by evidence than some sober reflection on the state of cosmology. In other words, Big Bang thinking is controlling how people see things and interpret things. So, let's summarize then. Regarding the origin of the cosmic egg, well, that was unknown and an uncomfortable question. And now we have hypotheses. But even if the origin of the energy at the beginning of the Big Bang is mysterious, it doesn't mean that the Big Bang did not happen. You can have a hypothesis about how something changed over time without knowing where it came from. For example, if you saw a car crash, you could use things like tire marks, collision patterns, broken fences or guardrails, etc. to tell you a whole bunch about how that car crash happened. But if you don't know what address the cars started at that day, it doesn't make you wrong about the crash. Regarding something coming from nothing, well, that's a scientific absurdity. Well, you don't know that, and even if you did, the Big Bang doesn't require anything to come from nothing. The origin of the moon is unknown, the origin of the solar system is unknown, the origin of stars and galaxies is unknown, so the Big Bang, I submit that is an unbelievable myth. Uh, no. <laughs> Even if you were right about that, which you're not, it wouldn't have anything to do with whether the Big Bang were right or not. Well, what about the age of the universe? Well, let me answer that question by asking another question. How old am I? This is an opportunity for audience participation. Would anybody like to guess my age? And there's no penalty if you get it wrong. I don't know, about 50 or so? I don't really care. Anybody? Yes. What's that? 59? Anybody else? 53? 63? 63? 63. <laughs> What's that? 42. 42. That's 43. That's very kind, but wide of the mark. <laughs> well, actually, uh, you were pretty close. Uh, I'll, I'll be 65 this summer. Man, mammals are weird. You guys age funny. I still don't care, though. 
but I don't always look my age. Sometimes that's an advantage, sometimes it's a disadvantage. But listen, wait a minute. How do you know that's correct? I don't know it's correct. And if we were going to assume a lack of any documentary evidence, we could do things like test your bone porosity, tooth wear patterns, skull sutures, etc., and come up with an approximate age. But I'm sure that would be historical science or something. What if God supernaturally created me a half an hour before I came into this room? Then either he supernaturally created you to look exactly like you're of some age, and it doesn't matter because in every way that we can test you are a particular age, or you are anomalous and evidence for some kind of miracle. If the latter, that'd be pretty darn cool, but if the former, you're nothing special as far as anyone can tell, and you're not evidence for spontaneous creation of humans a half hour ago. See, every one of your estimates on my age, you were making an assumption. You were assuming that I came into existence the same way you did and everybody else you know. You were making naturalistic assumptions. Yeah, because those are the only kind of assumption that are testable. And it's also the case that we only know of one way for humans to come into existence, and it's not spontaneous creation of adults. So until presented with evidence that such an option exists, it's irrational to take it seriously. Are you saying that being rational is a bad thing? I mean, you must be, since that's basically the whole point of this talk. But it's odd to hear you being so blunt about it and thinking that it makes you look good. But if God supernaturally created me, it'd be completely wrong. Yeah. Did he, though? Do you have any evidence you didn't grow from a zygote the way the rest of us did? And by us, I mean basically all multicellular life? Because unless you do, it's stupid to assume you didn't, or even entertain it as a reasonable possibility. If you don't know how I came into existence, you can't possibly know when I came into existence. But I do know how you came into existence. Because there's a lot of evidence that you resulted from a zygote that itself resulted from sexual intercourse between humans of opposite sex. And even the other options, like artificial insemination or in vitro fertilization, are not exactly options that would allow your physical age to be so dramatically different from your actual age that you could be a half hour old. Because the, the, the evolutionary estimates for the age of the universe are based on the same naturalistic assumptions that go into the Big Bang for explaining how the universe came into existence, but we see they don't know how anything came into existence. Well, you're just wrong about that. And are you going to now argue that God made the universe a few thousand years ago and it just looks like there was a Big Bang? Because first, there's no reason to think that, because there's no way to differentiate that universe from one that was formed by a Big Bang. And second, the Big Bang retains its explanatory power. Also, of course, it makes God a liar, and an omnipotent liar isn't the sort of thing you really want in your epistemology. Now, I don't always trust Wikipedia, but I do trust them pretty strongly whenever they're talking about evolution, because the articles are written by evolutionists and the footnotes are in the technical peer-reviewed literature. Calculating the age of the universe is accurate only if the assumptions built into the models being used to estimate it are also accurate. Good thing those assumptions can and are tested, but even if they were inaccurate to some degree, it's certainly not to the degree that could allow for a creation only a few thousand years ago. At the very least, the universe can't be any younger than Earth, and that is certainly a few billion years old, which puts a lower limit on the age of the universe. Well, they've got this chart with it, and you can see at the very beginning, the earliest universe down at the bottom, earliest gravity, then earliest light, cosmic expansion, dark matter, dark energy, which they don't know what that is. And then you've got the first single-celled creature and photosynthesis and multi-celled creatures and eventually man. The article goes on, in, the phys in physical cosmology, the age of the universe is the time elapsed since the Big Bang. See, they've just assumed that the Big Bang is true. No, it's been well demonstrated. The universe is expanding. It was smaller. Numerous predictions of the Big Bang have been verified. It has yet to be falsified. And current physics knows of no way to not have the universe start with a Big Bang given its current expansion. The Big Bang isn't an assumption. Measurements of the cosmic background radiation. The cosmic microwave background radiation that should only be there if there were a Big Bang and that is otherwise inexplicable. Okay. Give the cooling time of the universe since the Big Bang because they assume that the universe has been expanding 
and cooling at a certain rate. Again, not an assumption. It's a measurement. A measurement cross-confirmed by various standard candles and redshift measurements. Maybe to a creationist, assumption just means thing we've shown to be true with high confidence. And measurements of the expansion rate of the universe can be used to calculate its approximate age by extrapolating backwards in time. Well, they're making some more assumptions. They're assuming that even if the universe is expanding right now, that it expanded from a simple point. That's not an assumption either, at least not anymore. There is evidence for it, some of which you just mentioned, and it's also the logical consequence of the expansion of the universe, since when run backwards, that results in an ever-decreasing scale of the universe. What if it was made just a little bit smaller than it is now and it's expanded since then? Then there would not be a cosmic microwave background, the apparent age of galaxies would not correspond so closely with their distance, and there would be no reason to expect redshift and distance to correlate so strongly. And we wouldn't be able to see farther than a few thousand light years. In other words, unless God lied about it, the universe wouldn't look as it does. The thing is, the universe do what it do, and what it do is be old. You see the assumptions hidden? Well, nothing's hidden, and the only assumption is the assumption that physics isn't magic, and that neither are things in space. The things you listed are not assumptions, but conclusions based on volumes of data, which are then used to make future predictions and determinations. A new estimate of how fast the universe is expanding supports one side of an ongoing debate favoring a more rapid expansion. Observations of type 1a supernovas imply a faster expansion rate, known as the Hubble constant, that's than studies of cosmic background radiation. Yeah, this is a fairly recent finding, and currently the new age is seeming less likely. But neither option results in an age for the universe that's within five orders of magnitude of what you're suggesting it is. So whoever turns out to be right, and whatever that means for the data sets that seem to imply the other ages, you're wrong. You don't get to quibble over the difference of a few billion years when your suggestion is orders of magnitude outside the realm of possibility. It's like people arguing over whether the drive to the next city over is 10 or 12 miles, while you're there saying it's a bit under a foot. You are simply not part of that conversation because your suggestion is so ludicrously wrong that it's barely worth even noticing. That's why it's left to people like me to interact with it because the adults in the room are busy doing real science. If the disagreement persists, it could indicate something amiss in scientists' understanding of the cosmos. Yup, and that will prompt refinement of cosmological theories. And I guarantee you, it won't shrink 10 miles into 10 inches, and that's what you need it to do to be right. Perhaps related to the mysterious dark energy that is accelerating the universe's expansion. But when we think about the the origin or the age of the universe, there are some objects that lead us to believe it's not anywhere close to what the evolutionists say. Ooh, that sounds like you're going to actually offer evidence for your position rather than quote mining scientists and pretending that disagreements about the exact age of the universe within the scope of a few billion years can make an age of a few thousand years reasonable. This should be interesting. As far as our solar system, which is said to be uh, five billion, about five billion years old, there are short period comets. Okay, I'm pretty sure I know where you're going to go with this, and I plan to debunk it when you get there, but the age of the solar system and anything in it puts a lower, not an upper age limit on the age of the universe. The universe can't be younger than the youngest thing you can find, but it can be much older. If the whole solar system were 6,000 years old, that wouldn't mean anything for the age of the universe. Short period comets go around the sun every less than 200 years. Long period comets take longer to go around the sun. But every time a comet goes around the sun, it's going in a very, very elliptical orbit. And uh, it gets quite close to the sun uh, on one part of the orbit. And when it does, the heat and the energy coming from the sun melt some of the ice, breaks off some of the rocks, and that comet's only going to go around the sun so many times before it's the last lap. It's blown to smithereens. That's a pretty good explanation. I have no particular argument with you so far. And Halley's Comet makes that path every 76 years, and uh, it's not going to last forever. There's a problem. We have comets in our solar system. And if our solar system was really four and a half to five billion years old, 
There shouldn't be any comets. They should have all been destroyed. Speaking of hidden assumptions that you like to complain about, Dr. Mortensen, your hidden assumption is that current short period comets are primordial. If we have reason to think that they are not, such as knowing about much older objects than comets, or if there were some source for long period comets that can become short period comets, then this argument falls flat on its face. And so the evolutionists have come up with two uh, explanations for where more comets can come into the system. One is uh, the Kuiper belt, which is just past the orbit of Neptune, and there are objects out there, but they're too large and the wrong composition. And then there's the Oort cloud, which is said to be past the orbit of Pluto. In fact, the Kuiper belt is not made up of only large objects. It's just that those are the easy ones to find, since they're the ones that reflect the most light. And their composition is not wrong, it's perfectly fine being mostly made up of volatiles. It's just that as a short period comet orbits, it will lose the lightest and easiest sublimated volatiles first, and so over time its composition will change from its original. And yes, the Oort cloud is another pool of icy bodies that are primarily small and could be disturbed into a lower orbit. But its distance from the Sun makes it more likely a source for short period than long period comets. But it's never been observed. They've never observed anything out there. It's true that direct observation of the Oort cloud is currently lacking, but until you eliminate the possibility, then the combination of verifiably old objects in the solar system with the presence of short period comets makes its existence a far better option than, even though the solar system is old, it's not old, which is basically the option you're asking us to consider, Dr. Mortensen. So it's just assumed, and then they've got the problem of explaining how you knock these things into orbit. They're already in orbit. They only need their perihelion lowered sufficiently. And that's the kind of thing that happens after a close flyby with another body of sufficient mass. In other words, gravity and orbital mechanics is how it happens. Do I have to bring out more Kerbal Space Program footage? Because I will if I have to. Well, if you want to know more about the problem of comets for the billions of years, we have an article on our website, and you can look at that further. Recently, a space probe going by Pluto uh, took close-up images of a region near Pluto's equator, revealing a giant surprise, a range of youthful mountains. See, what they observe is surprising them because they have an evolutionary assumption of long ages. No, it surprised them because they thought that Pluto would probably be rather inactive geologically, but that seems not to be the case. Fortunately, there are plenty of options that can make small, cold bodies geologically active, such as tidal forces. Well, I think that's going to be it for today. Unfortunately, we left the Big Bang and went back to the solar system, and I don't really understand why, because nothing in the solar system can really tell us much about the Big Bang. But whatever. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino. If you'd like to support the channel in a one-time way, I have both a Teespring merch store as well as an Amazon wish list. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, Henry Hutanen, Chris Love, and Res Instance. My team over at Patreon are helping me make these videos, and I have tiers starting as low as a dollar and going all the way up to $100. So if you'd like to help out the Dapper Dino channel and help make these videos better and possibly even more frequent, then why don't you head over there and check it out? If a recurring donation isn't right for you, but you'd still like to help out, I have a link to my Amazon wishlist in the description. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.